I'm sorry. Art Hill Stasel Schools Board of Education. Uh, we're a little bit behind time again. I uh, apologize for that. Uh, so we'll go ahead. Is there any adjustments or changes to the agenda? Just wait. One minute. Yeah, I think they got something. So, Chairman Howe, let's move Tim Ivey. He's also down for number 12 on the back page. If we could, let's move that right after 7. That way we'll have Mr. Ivey do all three presentations at the same time. All right, going to move number 12 to number 7. Number to number 8. Number 8. Then okay. shift the rest of the agenda down one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just got a text from uh, Mr. Brodovitz. He went to Ray Street by mistake, so I'm sure. He, oh, he's, oh, he's here. Okay, never mind. <laughs> All right, good. Is there any other changes to the agenda? Okay, I need a motion to approve the agenda. Okay, is there a second? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye, please. Aye. Opposed? Pass the 7 up. Thank you. I would like to ask the public to understand that our cow meeting is an informal meeting. This is a time that the board can gather information in order to make an informed decision. Please do not misunderstand that when a board member asks a question, it is, not for, it is for information only. It is not indicative, indicative of how they're going to vote. Some time ago, we recognized the agenda so the public could make comments before the vote uh, is taken. So that for next Monday night, if there's something that we're going to have on the agenda that you would like to comment about, you will have time before there is a vote. Thank you. Uh, Dr. James. Thank you, Chairman Howe. I'd like to introduce Mark Brodovitz. And if Mark wants to make his way up, I'll tell you how we met. Um, of course, character education, as we look nationwide, uh, continues to be, I think, a concern of all of ours. As a matter of fact, last Wednesday night uh, at the Civic Center, we had a conversation along those lines. So um, looked at what Mark uh, had, and uh, I think it fits very well with what we already do with character education, which is a lot. And I've asked the team over the next months to uh, bring in what we do for character education, but I think what Mark has brought and made available through PDF, we're able to do our own printing and put in our hallways. In addition, uh, some of you guys have been out visiting schools, if not all of you, and uh, we have some schools that um, are very decorative when you walk down the halls, and we have some that are just plain color. So, um, so I have made a challenge to the curriculum team and art teachers and art students or just students to decorate our halls and I think the what Mark is going to present tonight uh, makes a good addition to that and I'll let him tell you a little bit about how this come about and how it ties I'm just telling you it ties in with our character education so it was a good thing to hook up with Mark and uh, Mr. Kubinick uh, connected us together and uh, we've had uh, several conversations so go ahead Mark. Thank you, Dr. James, and uh, thank you, school board, for letting me address you tonight. As he mentioned, I'm Mark Brodowitz. I'm a husband of 30-plus years, a father of three terrific sons, and now a grandfather. And I'm here to call out and to address a growing problem in our schools and society at large called iniquities. Now, many of you may have long ago forgotten what that word meant or never heard it before tonight but it is what's plaguing this country. Iniquities, according to a Google search, is defined as immoral or gross behavior. 
It is not to be confused with iniquities, which is unfair treatment. Iniquities or immoral behavior is something that has ebbed and flowed throughout our country's history. Its current cause can be many. Some might say it's from the animosity in politics to the ill will in social media. Others might believe it's from the frustration of racial issues to the isolation of the pandemic, while still others from violence found in our video games and entertainment to uncertainty in our livelihoods and the economy. Or it might just be the loss of a calling for something greater than ourselves. Regardless of the origin, the stress of any or all of these factors has magnified society's iniquities and thus impacted both the family unit as well as our classrooms, causing challenges for both parents and teachers alike. Everyone is looking for ways to improve decorum in our homes and classrooms, which has led to a variety of different theories and programs to address iniquities with at best mixed results. What we need may have been forgotten. So as the saying goes, when all else fails, start at the beginning. In this case, the beginning is a poster of six simple values that should be placed in every classroom and in some common areas throughout schools. In the poster that clearly states the bedrock values shared across every culture, race, gender, or religion. It is the tree trunk values that Dr. James spoke about, very simple. And it has nothing more than the basic rules or associated values that have been around for thousands of years in our, in our world. And like a tree without a trunk, children cannot intellectually grow or reach their fullest potential without a solid moral foundation. As you can see, this is the tree trunk value poster and there are six values on here. Family, life, relationship, giving, integrity, what you have. The tree trunk value poster focuses on a set of values while asking the reader an important question. What are yours? Which you'll see down here. And it does come in other versions. And while the listed values seem to be common sense, really does a day go by that we don't see on the evening news some sort of behavior somewhere in our North Carolina schools. So maybe, just maybe, posting the tree trunk values in and around our schools will consciously and unconsciously impact the hearts and minds of our children since it's always been on the wall for them to look at and see. To paraphrase Albert Einstein, education is what remains when one is forgotten what they learned in schools. Let that sink in. Education is what remains when you've forgotten what you've learned. On that note, I would like to recognize and give a shout out to the Iredale School District for being the first school system in the country to be posting the tree trunk values in their classrooms and common areas. It is my hope that this simple act might rekindle the fundamental respect and decorum missing today in many of our citizens and is so critically needed in our free society. In closing, I will state the obvious. It is never easy to be first. However, that has never stopped North Carolinians before. In fact, over 250 years ago, a few Carolinians dared to overcome government tyranny and pen the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. Today, that brave action allows North Carolina to be known as the first in freedom. Over 100 years ago, two young men at Kitty Hawk dared to take on gravity. Today, North Carolina is known for that brave action as the first in flight. This year, may the Iredell County School Board actions and the schools to take on social iniquities through the posting of tree trunk values not only improve the character of its students, but make North Carolina known to all as the first in values. I appreciate the school board's opportunity to speak and always remember to push for our faith, our families, and our fellow citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your service. Thanks, sir.
Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to point out that Mark contacted me a few months ago. He's not seeking any remuneration. He created this concept on his own. He hasn't copywritten it or trademarked it. He's not seeking any payment. He's, a, he's just a leader in our community who wants to help grow our, our county and our schools. So well on to him. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next item on your agenda is the North Carolina general statute allows the Iredell Statesful Board of Education to appoint two members to the Mitchell Community College Board of Trustees. Dr. Ralph Bentley and Dr. Steve Hill has served as our appointees for several terms. Dr. Hill has been appointed since 2010 and his current term will expire June the 30th this year. Dr. Hill retired from Iredell Statesville Schools in 2008 with 30 years of service to the district. Dr. Hill served the district as a teacher, assistant principal, principal, and assistant superintendent. His background in career and technical education has his experience as a trustee along with his continued engagement with the greater community makes him an ideal candidate to represent the interest of our district and our students on the Mitchell College Board of Trustees. Next week, I will ask you to vote. Uh, if you want to nominate someone at that time, then uh, for consideration, uh, you can. But we do have two members and uh, Dr. Hill is one of them. Any questions? May I make a quick statement, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, just for the board's information, uh, every school board elects, if, if they have a community college in their county, elects um, up to four, depending, since you have two school districts, you split those elections with Mooresville. Uh, there is currently a bill in the General Assembly that would take this uh, appointment power away. Um, and it would give the appoint. It would take the governor's appointment of power away, and it would take the local school board appointment of power away. It would leave in place the county commissioners. Right now, the governor appoints four, county commissioners appoint four, and the local school boards appoint four. If this bill passes, starting upon the next cycle for each trustee, every everybody would get to work out their term. Um, the Senate and the House, I believe, would each get four, and then the local county commissioners would get four. So I just wanted to make you aware of that pending legislation. Thank you. All right. Uh, Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, hey, Dr. James, uh, I'm not aware of Dr. Hill, and maybe some of the other board members aren't either. So just a few questions. Um, since he served since 2010, um, are there other candidates that might be interested in this position that we would want to consider. Um, um, do we have a record of his accomplishments in serving in this position for the last 13 years? Um, and could we have some other documentation on himself just so that we can better understand him? Yes, so I will, um, after tonight's meeting, see what I can get you on Dr. Hill. He was our career technical director here, assistant superintendent, um, and career technical education fell underneath his realm in secondary education. Um, so I know he's passionate about making a very simple transition between K-12 and Mitchell College or college, and that, that seems to be an, an angst for some communities and not for others. I think we have a great working partnership and part of that is both him and Dr. Bentley have served that purpose. They understand the need for our kids to get additional credentialing. And of course, what the general public has to understand, if they get those courses while they're here with us, still as a K-12 student, it's all paid for by your tax dollars. So it's a way to get, get students not only a four-year degree, but certifications, and we're seeing more and more of that. So one thing we report out on in the world of career technical education is the number of certifications our kids get. 
last year when we done our uh, return on equity, we had over about almost 3,100 certifications. So those certifications are money for students that walk into an industry because they're industry recognized. So I will uh, uh, definitely get you that information and, and get it to you, hopefully, if it's maybe in the Friday update, but we'll work on that. Yes, sir. Any other comments, questions? has any bearing or not it might help to understand he's also the what would you call him the he's the one that put it together and he's the curator of the Statesville Historic Museum and his collection is second to none and most of it uh, a high percentage of it would be what he has put together uh, the people have brought things in but his original collection and the things that he and he personally has added it, that that museum is unreal it's really good thank you any other questions or comments i have visited that and it is exceptional it's good to see how uh, ardell county statesville have grown over the years okay miss elliott Good evening, I'm Chairman Howe, Dr. James, and members of the board. Um, each year, the Department of Public Instruction and the Office of Accountability requires district to obtain approval for the alternate, alternate schools accountability modified system, um, which has to be submitted by August the 1st of each year for the next school year. Uh, the modified system will be approved for Northview Academy and Discovery Place at the Springs. Um, this is a system that they put in so that these schools can show um, how they're doing academically, how they're doing, um, you know, with growth, how they're doing with keeping the kids in school. Um, and we know that with um, Northview is our alternative school and Discovery Place is our, um, our EC school. So both of those qualify for this system. Um, the alternative accountability system is a supplement to the school performance grades. It's not a replacement to any of the federal requirements, so they're still, they still have to hold all those. Um, and each school will still receive a school performance grade if there is sufficient data. And when we talk about sufficient data, there has to be a, there's an N factor. They have to have a certain number of students per grade per subject to make um, a count. Um, to be included. So they give us three options. Um, the first option is we can just keep them as school performance grade only. Option B is we participate in a modified system. And then C is that we write our own modifications to the accountability system and it has to be approved by the State Board of Education. So in the past several years, um, I mean, I, this has been going, I guess, back to 16, 17, I think, anyway, um, we have always chosen option B. And in the memo, I showed you what indicators are included in option B. And one, the first one is student persistence, and that counts for 20%. And those are the students that stay enrolled in any public school for the entire school year. They get credit for those students that stay in school. Um, we get credit because they're not a dropout, and they eventually will be a graduate for us. Number two is um, school achievement. So school achievement is 20%. And you see there, you know, with these schools, they are K-12. So they have every assessment known to the state. So they have the EOGs, the EOCs, they have the ACT, they have the ACT work keys, their graduation four-year and five-year counts in this, and the math course rigor. So math course rigor are those students that graduate and have a math three credit. Um, so that's what plays into that indicator. And then three years of data are used to calculate the school achievement. And then number three is growth. So for these schools, growth is counted 60% in this model. And so, and that growth will be counted, calculated by EBOS. And so they calculate that and then they get you know, they, they still get that school performance grade, 
But then we get, th you know, they can have three ratings. They can have progressing, they can have maintaining, or they can have declining. And so I put on there what our previous year's data. Um, so last year, both schools were maintaining. Uh, we didn't have the, uh, scores in 1920 and 2021, thanks to COVID. And then Northview, um, you know, at that time they were called Presley, they were maintaining in 1718 and 1819. So we can see that they're not declining, which is always good, and they're maintaining um, everything at those two schools. So, do you have any questions? Is there any questions from Ms. Elliott? So, Chairman Howe, if you haven't got to visit um, Northview Academy, I would encourage you to. They actually have a full-blown print shop. The state superintendent got to visit it. The students actually run it. And it's paired with Math 1, which is one of the hardest subjects that our kids struggle with. So they're, they're learning by doing. So when they're making a shirt and they have to figure out profit, uh, X plus Y equals Z, so they pull math into it, and those students have been much more successful in performance-based learning Math 1, where most of those students would struggle in a regular Math 1 class. Thank you. Any questions, comments? I do. I just got to thinking. Um, recently, there was a STEAM night at Northview, correct? First ever STEAM night at Northview, which I think is a good thing. Unfortunately, looking at these metrics, I'm sorry, um, about the only one I think, I mean, it's, you can't include that quantitatively, specifically there. But what you can say is student persistence, and hopefully maybe it in, uh, increases some end of grade, science grades specifically, but stuff like that, you can't really, it's hard to quantify the effect, um, but it's needed. And I would argue that environment you're creating makes makes it more conducive to student learning. And I don't know, no, these are things, I guess what I'm just asking is, and it's probably can't, is there any way to include some sort of like, you know, clubs, number of clubs, number of, of um, competitions, number of activities, something I could, is there any way to include that in the metric if we get to make this decision? Um, if if not this time, if not this time, Laura, the state is working on portrait of a graduate. Yes, and it pretty well encompasses uh, encompasses about everything you just said. So the state has finally recognized that one one time a year taking a test does not define your value in the education system because right. there's a heck of a lot of people that fail a test that are working on your cars, your HVAC welding things that are dental assistants. So um, they have recognized multiple matrix. We have worked on portrait of a graduate since last summer. We took a group to uh, Bill Daggett in Washington and um, successful practice network. So we're sort of ahead of the game. So the, the state superintendent was excited about that. But yes, several of these matrices uh, will include different things besides proficiency which we already know is, is a worthless model. And by the way, I failed my first test in graduate school, just saying, and I've done okay. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, but, it, it, but, you know, all kidding aside, it, I think this is just something important to include. I don't know if we, can do, if we can't do it here, but it will be included in things going forward and metrics going forward of our evaluation of the school. Is that what I you're saying? What you, I mean, what you hit on was the student persistence because yeah. they are involved. They and stay. The print shop, they're going to stay. And so the school does get credit for that. Okay. I'm just I'm yep. trying to quantify it somehow, and it's. Well, and also, if, you know, if they're a completer in ACT work keys. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, then they can take that, and, you know, if they get that certificate, then that follows them and they can get a job. Qualitative also, I mean, qualitative increases many times show up quantitatively, just not directly. Right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. And to add on to what Dr. James was saying, so I, I went to Northview as one of the first schools I visited, and I was very pleased and, and actually very interested in what was going on there. And last week at our community violence workshop that was held, there was a lady that 
had a view of Northview. Uh, I, I think she called it a hell or a prison or words to that effect. And I, I hope she's watching, but here's my takeaway on what Northview is. So to get into Northview, you have to qualify by, um, let's just say, bad behavior, right? Those are some of the elements. And it's essentially a cross between you can have expulsion or you can have accountability for that child. So that child can be held accountable for a transgression that he or she may have done. And then while they're there, they're continuing their schooling. And in order to get their ticket out, as I understand it, they have to maintain good behavior, they have to maintain an attendance record, and they have to do well academically. And if they achieve those things, then they can either go back to the school from which they came or they can continue on in Northview. I think that's correct, right, Dr. Jameson? So yes. it's a very worthwhile program um, to deal with the, you know, the Versus expulsion versus trying to teach a kid a life lesson, but it also provides potentially some niches for those children that need a certain environment that their traditional school didn't offer. So uh, I hope that lady's watching this and other people are watching and, and go visit Northview, go talk to them. It's, it's, it was very interesting, thank you. Any other questions or comments? It is a challenge for the teachers there, I will say that, to, and they're doing a tremendous job. Um, can we put this on the consent agenda? Okay, does anybody have a problem with that? Okay, let's just put that on. So, Mr. Howe, I would tell you that you'd be hard-pressed to get any teacher over there to leave that school. because is that right? Because they see the growth in those students, and they see they're making a difference. And what I would like to see, and we're, we're trying our best to get there, is to pro promote more hands-on learning there. This is a complete print shop. The, the kids are running it. The, the adults step back, and the kids run the print shop. Screening. Screen. Yes, print screen. They're yeah. doing that. Plus, uh, yeah, right? right, so they can, they can do different things. We're wanting to uh, look at engraving and expand what the kids can do. But basically, we're teaching them life skills. That, you know, and, and matter of fact, the story of one of the individuals when we went there, uh, the student come there, didn't want to do anything, didn't want to cooperate, and they kept working with him. He he become the manager of the screen printing shop and completely changed his attitude, his life, and he trained the girl, uh, it was a girl, and trained the predecessor that's there now with screen printing. They do an excellent job. They know the whole process. They do 3D printing. So we're doing our best to expand that. Uh, every kid does not learn the same way. Hired Garner has already proven there's nine intelligences and you can't shove everybody in the same square box and expect them to learn. And public school keeps trying to do that, uh, probably because of the money. But we've got to come up with different ways to engage kids that learn differently. And hands-on is a great way to learn. By engraving, I'm sorry, Mr. How is it okay to speak? Sure. Um, by engraving, you're really talking about CNC engraving, correct? You're not talking about hand engraving. You're talking about CNC work. So basically, that's just a different head on the 3D printers. So if you can teach CNC engraving, you know, engraving, you're teaching CNC skills. You're teaching CAD CAM skills, which I don't want to get in the weeds, but you know, if machining skills. I mean, because that's engraving with if, with a laser or with a cutter is i mean you're, you're teaching life skills and job skills when they get out big time job skills okay thank you, thank you. mr ivy mr howe uh, members of the board dr james i bring before you a request for approval of roof replacement at facilities and planning this is over the mezzanine section and a small portion of the warehouse uh, that was not completed, and we need this to be done as part of our consolidation. Um, one of the areas that we are consolidating is into the upper and lower mezzanines, and so this is uh, to place a TPO over top of the aluminum roof that we currently have. Um, I provided with you the sealed bids that came in on March 30th. 
Um, also, uh, the bid table, um, the scope of work, and some photographs for your review. So if approved, we would like to award the bid to Ballard Roofing for uh, $101,700. Be glad to answer any questions. About Anyone have any questions about this? Is is this the company that did uh, West Iredale High School several years ago? I do not know off the top of my head, sir. I'm just curious. Well, Mr. Ivey, did you notice that in your request you asked for labor and material warranty information from the the, the potential bidders, right? You asked for that, and only one company gave you that. I did notice that. Right, Ballard Roofing. So, um, but do you do you normally state any sort of other quality requirements? Because I don't see quality requirements listed in there. I see warranty, but not quality. Um, absolutely. So when they replace it, they have to put in a certain type of roof, and so it all has to meet that specific quality. Thank you. You are. They have to replace the nailer around there too, correct? Yes, they do. Okay. What gauge metal are they going to be using? Do you know that? I see this one. There should be um, replacing them. The what they've done on the rest of the roof is they've placed in between the metal. They've gone in and put some insulation, and they're putting TPO over top of it. It was my understanding. The gauge of the roof and metal is what I was. Oh, you're putting. Membrane and not roofing. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, you're still there. I am still here, and I'm glad to still be here. So. <laughs> um, the next recruit, uh, request is for approval of repaving the rear parking lot at South Idle High School. Uh, this is a project that we've spent a lot of time looking into. And on April 20th, we had a formal bid submitted and for this project. And so below, I've listed out on your memo the uh, um, companies that submitted bids. Um, also, if approved, we would like to award the bid to Carolina Paving for $189,205. I included pictures for you of the back parking lot as well as uh, the bids and the scope of work along with an aerial view. I'd be glad to answer any questions about that. Um, that back parking lot has been uh, behind the school and is in severe deterioration, as you can see. So uh, it is a, a need for the school to have that redone. Is that asphalt? Yes, sir. And how many inches? So. The, they are actually putting down on the one part, I don't know the exact number of inches that they're putting in, but they have to put in a certain grade. So because the uh, trash trucks come back and forth to pick up the dumpsters, they have to put in a bus grade is what they call it, or commercial grade thickness in those areas. And in the area that goes between the mega unit and the back of the school, they will put in a lesser grade because you don't have high traffic vehicles on those but everywhere else has to be a high grade because of those big trucks coming in and out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Ivey, are the quality requirements, again, stipulated in the materials that are listed there? They are. When they okay. meet for the bid meeting, they go over that with okay. them. But I didn't see any warranty. They don't typically put a warranty on paving. They will for a certain amount of time, but it's typically after the paving's done, you have it for uh, defect. Most of the time, it runs about a year. Okay, well, I mean, you could always put it in there, right? If, if that's something the board would like for me to request to moving forward, we certainly can. I, I think we should always specify warranty and quality requirements for everything we do. Sure. Well, it's something that's been needed for a long, long time back there. It's been terrible. And uh, it goes back to when I was teaching and coaching, and my last year was 2004, and it needed paving then. So there's no doubt it needs it now. Any other questions or comments? It would be nice to put that warranty in there. And if we get a warranty on that, could we also pass that along to our highways and have them put warranties <laughs> on those? I, I th they're going to look at you funny when you mention warranty. 
And the highway system, don't, they, I don't think they entertain it. They don't even look at it. You're having a, a very hard time getting a paving warranty um, reimbursed, especially where we've seen it. Like with tennis courts, you have to have um, some extreme testing for them to be able to prove it because there's a lot of different moving parts with asphalt. But if it happens with a certain amount of time, most companies are more than welcome to come back and do the repair. But we've not had any issues with the ones that we've selected here. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you ask for a warranty on payment, it's gonna cost you a lot more and the warranty won't be any good, correct? I mean, that's the way it is, that's just the way it is. With most paper. of the time, and what I've seen is these companies are very good to work with, and if something they put down does not stand up within a certain amount of time, they'll come back and repair a patch spot in here or there. Um, we've just not had an issue with anybody having a warranty on asphalt. Most of the time when you see that's on tennis courts and surfaces like that, where they're gonna give you a longer lifespan on it, and they just warranty off of the top surface, the coating they put on top of the asphalt is what the tennis companies typically do. And since the asphalt has lasted this long, it wouldn't be worth putting concrete in front of the dumpsters for the area where they lift them? The dumpsters already have concrete in front of them. We had to put that in because it had gotten so deteriorated, they were actually backing up into mud, which you can see some of that on the picture there where the dirt is. Any other questions, comments? Okay, Harmony. Yes, okay, so we bring, or I bring before you the approval of the architectural contract for the Harmony renovations. This is for the, what they typically call the fourth and fifth grade ring wing, but um, they've moved some of the school around, so they have different grades in there at this time, but it's considered the old wing. And so on November 14th of 2022, the Board of Education did select Pinnacle Architecture to design the renovations for Harmony. And so um, their AIA contract, which is standard architectural contract, has been looked over by uh, Mr. Shatley, and it is asking for standard 7% renovation cost. They're giving us an estimated cost of about $3 million for that project. And so the contract is stated for it not to exceed $210,000 for their work on this project. So that certainly can fluctuate if the project comes in lower. Uh, board, I would like to say that uh, Mr. Kubinick and myself visited Harmony last week. And uh, basically we went up there to see uh, the renovation. And uh, at first uh, I was disappointed in, 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 in what was gonna happen. Uh, but then I did look at the plans uh, today, and uh, I, I feel like it's going to be first class uh, when it's completed. Um, they are getting gang bathrooms. If you had ever been up there and seen the bathroom, whoever, whoever designed that school, uh, well, I won't say what I really think. Anyway, it was, it's a mess. Uh, you, you get... Uh, a bunch of children and you've got one toilet and one urinal for about maybe 75 or 80 kids. That doesn't work. And so we're, we're going to straighten those things out and I'm, I'm confident that those children will have a better school when it's all said and done. Uh, I was pleased with the rest of the school. It was clean. It was orderly. Uh, the children were engaged, so uh, you can't ask for much more than that. And uh, I think both of us felt that uh, it was, we didn't like what those children were having to, to go through and know that um, other children in this community have better schools. And hopefully uh, those children will have the same kind of, uh, of, of school as what we see in the rest of the county. Anyone else have anything? Mr. Chairman, how come we only considered one architect that we're considering for the bid? They did actually consider more than one architect. The board went through the selection process, and so that was the architectural firm that actually through the selection process was selected. Well, that was in the previous? Yes. Previous board, okay. Yeah, so they had to go through and select all of them, and we had to go through a scoring process. So we did a request for qualifications, and they, uh, or request for proposals, they turned it in, 
and then uh, the board selected the architects for those projects. There were several projects that they did, but Pinnacle was the one that they selected for Harmony. So will they provide construction drawings? Yes, and because, I have those. Okay. It's okay. just we haven't officially signed the contract, and so I did talk to them about sending them to me today in case somebody okay. wanted to look at them. So. I want to point out, because on page 12, it, they're not provided. It lists there on that table. But then later on, when it talks about on page 21, um, do you have any leeway in, in – um, we're paying 80% of their fee before construction even starts. That seems to be providing too much upfront money when they're managing this project. But no? That's normal. That's normal? Yeah, that's the, the contract administration is going to be the smallest part, especially in a renovation of this size, it's going to be the smallest part. The percentages are, are relatively the same here as they would be in a new construction, but maybe varied a little bit. But that's they're going to do all their work, most of their work, not all, most of the work up front before construction starts. Okay. Last question, is is like a 7% fee of the entire budget a standard thing, or you just don't pay a set fee? It is a standard. It, and you have some that will go off of a fee, depending on the type of project, and then, but most of them you see between 6 and 8% is standard. Okay, because Dr. James speaks of $18,000 toilets all the time, and there's no more work going into a design plan, whether it's a $500 toilet or 18000 So that was my point there. I, I would add that 7% for a renovation of this size is very reasonable, and it's probably Pinnacle's desire to maybe get future work. But... But I would have to say, Co-Chair Kupinick, there's a lot more engineering goes into a Toto toilet than goes into a regular Kohler. <laughs> that direct experience, you know that? We're not going to have a workshop on toilets, are we? <laughs> I think we need to flush this idea and move on to the next. I would like to say before we, we go on to the next item, <laughs> that uh, this is a project that was supposed to be done in, if I'm, 2007. Thank you, Dr. James. And our county commissioners were, it's, it was their, their job to do it. Well, as most people know, we, uh, the school system sold um, Mount Morn. And the former board took that money to complete projects so that we could go ahead and get these projects done and took those things off of the plate of the county commissioners in hopes we could get funding for the new high school. And so that's, that's one of the things. So we took how many millions of dollars off their plate? Uh, so it's around $89 million worth of projects that were yeah. listed on the economic sheet or education spreadsheet that was right. provided by the county that we took off of theirs and added onto ours. And instead of doing complete teardown rebuilds, we chose to do renovations to several of those properties. So we not only use tax dollars in, in, in a good way, we also turned old buildings that uh, we couldn't use into capital and use invested that back in our school so i think we're responsible and uh, even though some people might disagree okay any other questions well i think harmony also uh, mr russo requested furniture so we'll we'll work within our budget to make that happen and then the gym floor like many of our old gyms uh, there's some structural issues underneath the floor that we'll fix and I think a, a good thing that Tim and I talked about today about the renovation, they'll have access when you're playing uh, outside sports to some restrooms where it's, they don't now. And believe it or not, we have built some brand new schools that do not have easy access to a restroom because I get those calls also. And uh, some schools have invested in Porta Johns, but it's sort of sad to know that we have a brand new school with, without access for the sports fields into a decent restroom. 
Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Dr. Mazzell. Good evening, Chairman Howell, Board of Education, and Dr. James. Um, just wanted to come back to you um, to discuss if they have any further questions from our um, closed session from the personnel report. Any questions from anyone? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We'd like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Mazell is now Dr. Mazell having uh, completed his doctorate this week, this past week. So, congratulations. Dr. Nutting. Good evening, uh, Chairman Howell, members of the board, Dr. James. I'm bringing to you tonight a policy update. It's policy 5240. Uh, this policy has to do with advertising in schools, and we're not asking you for uh, anything other than to uh, check this out, and we'll bring it back to you uh, next month. Um, we did notice we were working on some um, guidelines for signage at athletic events and that type of thing, and realized that our advertising in the school policy hadn't been updated for quite some time, in fact, since 2002. Uh, so... We need to bring this um, advertising policy um, up to compliance with the North Carolina School Board Association. Um, really, essentially, not many changes at all to this. It's more just uh, clarifying language throughout the policy, uh, referencing uh, other policies that have changed since that time. So um, pretty straightforward, but I ask you to consider this, and then we'll come back to you next month to see about voting for this policy. Any questions? Any questions? Just real quickly, if it's okay, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, basically, you're just updating for the, it's, there's nothing thrown in here for what, not, for not nothing really. specific to us. It's just updating. It, it really is just updating and, and properly referencing to other policies. It makes some reference to policy 4720, um, collapses a few things and sure. just brings it up to date. Good. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, just a minute. I, I do have a, sorry, a dean. Would it be appropriate to put uh, at the end of the first paragraph, uh, failure to abide by this would be a uh, possibility of suspension I didn't read anything uh, that gave any consequences for not following this. This policy really is more geared. Oh, sorry, guys. The policy really is more geared for third parties doing advertising in the school. Okay. And, and not necessarily uh, our folks. Um, so this would be this is the process that says, well, what, who can advertise, what can be advertised, and what what is the process of approving advertisements in the school? Whether that's just you know, on a on the fence at the uh, stadium or on the wall in the gym or in the yearbook or, or something else that might ultimately get to students during the school day or after school. Um, so I don't necessarily think you need anything in here that would talk about failure to abide by the policy can result in disciplinary action because most of the folks in here are going to be third parties. Uh, but we do have policies you know, regarding what otherwise may be distributed to students too. Uh, during the school day that, are, that is not necessarily advertisement or, or commercial purpose material, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? I, I got a question. It says uh, inappropriate considering the age of the students in the school. Well, what if we have younger age students vid visiting the school? It should be the same for any age school, correct? If you're asking me that, I mean, but potentially, sure. I mean, I think there is... There are some way there you know there are some differences between really young kids and and certainly high school kids and that may allow for some sort of different advertising at you know at, for again in the in the annual or 
your book, I should say, um, and there might be some things that you would say are, would be appropriate for high schoolers and, and not appropriate for elementary school, but it's just, I think, just one consideration. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much. Mr. Steele. Good evening, uh, Chairman Howe, fellow board members, and Dr. James. Uh, so the first item I have is the approval of RFP for auditors. As you know, Strickland Hardy, our auditor we had this current year, did not complete our audit in a timely fashion. So we received proposals from two of the largest firms. Uh, when we had talked to other firms, uh, our size does not, is not conducive uh, for their staff. So um, Anderson, Smith, and Wyke, uh, PLLC, and then uh, the correction in the memo from earlier, thanks to Mr. Kubinek, um, Dixon Hughes Goodman is now Forvis, LLP. Uh, they both, uh, based on a rubric, uh, based on discussion, uh, myself and others in the finance department, uh, Anderson, Smith, and Wyke uh, is the firm that we would recommend uh, to do the audit. Shannon Dennison, who uh, I'm familiar with, she has, is an audit partner and has 12 plus years of audit experience in the gov with governmental agencies. And then she also was a finance officer with Caswell County Schools and Alamance Burlington Schools as well. They currently serve uh, 79 school boards with seven partners. Uh, and their reviews uh, were very, very good. So. so my recommendation next week will be to go with a CPA firm that uh, has experience in the area of doing schools and uh, guarantee you that we will get our audit on time. Any other? I was the one that fussed about having it on time, but if there's no penalties, I, I'm, I'm for going with the cheaper one. There, there is penalties. What he uh, said last week. Well, don't, don't. Gotcha. What he said, so trust me, we were very close to being penalized by the federal government. They will withhold our federal funds. So we were within a couple of days of having our federal funds frozen. So, yes, there's penalties. And I, I got the bad letter from Department of Public Instruction, and it wasn't nice. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you. Our federal audit clearinghouse report, just for your information, Dean knows, it was not submitted till March 31st at 10 p.m. It was due by 11:59. That's not how you do business, in my opinion. I was I was never that late when I was an auditor. So, I, Mr. Chairman, I, go, go ahead, um, Mr. Steele. Before the board, last board voted for Strickland and Hardy to do this year. What firm was used in previous years? Previous was uh, Coffee and Lovett, a uh, local, local firm. And as soon as I came on board, he said he had, did not have the staff uh, to do it. John Rosenthal was the partner on the audit, and he said he could not perform it um, with the staff he had. Okay, but you were happy with them, yes? I'd never worked with them. Okay. Uh, Melissa wa was happy with them. Uh, there was no, okay. but he just didn't have the staff to perform the audit. Um, we'll say you that uh, the reason that we hadn't gone with uh, Wyke before was because Melissa was our uh, finance officer, so it it wouldn't it would be a conflict of interest to have her husband doing the audit. So anyway, that's why we didn't uh, go ahead, Miss Trent. Um, did either of those two firms give you any? Um anticipated completion dates for like the upcoming audits so, that yeah, we're um, so I met with Shannon and I talked to um, April Bell they both said all, October 31st they, they anticipated being done okay. Anderson said they're ready to go as soon as we uh, get approval they'll get our um, anticipated our interim work done 
-hmm. really, really soon because we really I should have interim work should be do, being going on right now and then the audit usually around September and they'll get it done really quick. Okay, and sorry, just one more. Um, do you know for either of the two firms how many staff accountants would be dedicated to the audit in addition to the auditing partner? Have yes, they given? So they both will have uh, two staff accountants okay. on, and then they both have to have a separate audit manager mm -hmm. partner uh, that will also come out and manage the audit. And so Anderson will send over a manager partner from one of their other officers. Okay, thank you. So for the board, Bill, I used Anderson, Smith & White, both in Montgomery and Stanley County. I will say when I walked into Stanley County, they were $800,000 in the red and had no fund balance. That was in February, so that meant they were bankrupt. So um, Anderson, Smith & White worked heavily with us to turn that around and end the year with $1.2 million in fund balance. So they uh, have a plethora of knowledge. They know the federal programs inside out. Uh, they definitely are a plus. They come in during the year. It's not just at audit time. So they'll pop in and do some intermittent audits during the year and let you know. They may call and say, is there anything you take? You know, you need to take a look at? And if I feel like it's one of the federal programs just doesn't feel correct or something's not right, I'll say, well, how about dropping by and let's look at you know, Title II funds, or let's look at Title III and run those down and see how things are going. Also, um, for our bookkeepers, don't get mad at me, um, we in the other two counties, we weren't doing a very good job at auditing our schools. And so actually, uh, Mike White and myself and Melissa actually come up with a very detailed audit selection process uh, that it made it very hard for any embezzlement to occur at school level if you're checking certain things. So uh, a lot of great work with that organization. And I think they were only $5,000 more, uh, Mr. Sloan. Mr. Okay. Chair, Mr. Chairman, Go ahead. just a quick question. Um, do you know, Mr. Steele, or have you heard, or did they provide any information about them being late or being reprimanded, audited themselves? Anything negative have you heard of them? None, none of them have been late. Uh, they both told me there is audits that are late, but it's nothing to their doing. It's stuff going on at each of those districts. But no, uh, none of them have been late. They've got them all in. And you feel very comfortable working with this firm? Yes. So I've worked for both of these firms previously, uh, Dixon Hughes, uh, Forvis. And why did you leave? Oh, excuse me. Because uh, <laughs> no, I go, I'm not going to interview process now. And then Anderson, Smith, and White. So I know these people very well I feel very comfortable with them they will do a high quality audit and provide a high quality information to you guys now this this firm you're recommending name the firm again Anderson Smith and Wyke okay Wyke now we didn't use Wyke before because of our CFO yeah but the Wyke is still there is he here and she's gone no, she's no still right. Mike is really an absentee partner right now he's slowly okay okay I, I, I'm just inter interested. <laughs> what is the due date uh, to uh, DPI for this audit? Uh, DPI's suggestion is October 31st is the due date. Yep. I know. <laughs> is there any other questions? Okay, will you have uh, budget amendments? Yes. Uh, so the budget amendments uh, for the month of May for state, we have $115,300. And that money, it brought new money from the state. Uh, 009 is our non-contributory employee benefits. When people retire, this is a guaranteed allotment from the state. So. Obviously, it's a guesstimate from year to year, so we're adjusting that up 110,000, and then highly qualified North Carolina teaching graduates. Uh, we've got we had an adjustment there based on additional employees that met that requirement, so we had to pay that. So that increased the state budget by 115,300. The local current expense budget 
um, is increasing by 257,000 with 254,000 being from interest. Uh, interest rates are up. We are taking advantage of that by investing some money uh, in different places. I, our interest income current to date is almost uh, 500,000 more than it was last year based on interest rates, based on cash flow that we have. We're able to invest it in some CDs and some things. We're taking advantage of everything we can right now based on a general statue. So that money uh, we have budgeted within transportation just to balance the budget. Hopefully this will reduce some of our, uh, our, our anticipated fund balance that we may be spending. So hopefully this will uh, decrease that. The federal budget uh, is increasing $178,442. And the new money there is from IDA preschool of 131,000. 320, we got a little bit more money in ESSER 181. Then the state came back on the principal retention supplements. Nobody's losing money here. This is just uh, money based on benefits. Uh, that allotment was reduced $5,426. Capital outlay funds is increasing by $2.1 million. And this is North Carolina provided replacement school buses. We have to book this as a budget amendment so that we're not out of compliance at year end when we make the, when we, if the buses were to come in. So this is booking the budget number. So if we end up paying right at year end, which is what happens, that we will be covered and not have an audit finding. The last budget amendments is your other special revenue fund and it total 460509 You'll see your first question may be, why are we reducing the school-based mental health grant by 468,738? They came back and said, that is a year two allotment. So they, we pulled it back, we didn't lose that money. We just have to shift the years. And then the, the other largest uh, number there is the $858,000. It's listed as computer buyback. It says community, but that's where we resold the computers back to the uh, company that won the bid uh, for the computer buyback. So that increases, based on those numbers, it increased the other special revenue fund by $460,509. And that is all the budget amendments. Any of the board members have questions? Just a quick question, if it's okay, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Steele, did we really sell a car for $310? It was a pro an older car uh, just, they may have scrap metaled it i'm about to say <laughs> if we had kids driving that one yeah. for driver's ed we're in trouble <laughs> well we do get the ones from the sheriff's department and most of the time when we get those cars that's uh it costs more to tow them to louis gordon's than they're worth <laughs> picking up I understand so if there's any drug dealers that want to give up a car why couldn't it be a new one Mr. Chairman, where do the 40,000 in do donations come from? 40,425? So that was a donation, and Dr. Nutting, correct me if I'm wrong, from uh, parents or PTA at Lakeshore Elementary. Is that? No. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Okay, we come to a good time. Board member comments. Okay, sir. Uh, my little board's not as big as his little board, and uh, I don't need a big one, but are we going to get big ones to go into the schools? That's what we're going to get to see. Yes, up there. we we have poster makers. So, out of the graciousness of his heart, he's given us the PDF files, so we can print them very large on our poster makers. And the schools will end up getting some of those. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Go ahead. I have a diatribe. Go ahead. I have a diatribe, so I'm sorry. So I apologize ahead of time, but. Um, 
No, sir, it's not a filibuster. It's maybe almost that long, though. Three monologues. All right. Mon thank you. Yeah, monologue. Um, first of all, we've got summer camps available, regist registration open. Please be registering for these summer camps if anyone's listening. I think we do a really good job. The system does a really good job with that. We, I don't. People actually work, do the job, and they do a really good job with summer camp. So if, uh, if, if your kids are interested and want something really fun to do and, and learn in the process, uh, our summer camps, I think, are high quality. Um, as you know, recently the school system presented three choices for multiple funding streams for a full high school, Weathers Creek as we're calling it. Um, we did that to the county commissioners. And I just want to preface everything else if I don't say it again. This is, these are my comments only. This is not the board. These are my comments about it and my thoughts on this. Um, but this was a first pass element an estimate. And Mr. Excuse me, uh, Dr. James, correct me if I'm wrong. If I say anything, so please do. Um, this is a first pass estimate of the design that was concluded with several um, county commissioners on the committee. They helped us do the design. Um, we also mentioned we're flexible. We mentioned these proposals were not a hard ask, ask, but um, it wasn't just this or nothing. Sorry, I had to say that right. Um, yes, sir. And it's up to the county commissioners, you know, to decide based on the ask that we had, um, just let us know what you can do. And that's what was presented, uh, that we're flexible, let us know. This is going through the process. This is the way the process is. Well, lo and behold, you know, you open up the internet in the morning, which is the new newspaper, and the county commissioners went around us and started negotiating with by media and basically said, you know, by inference or sometimes directly, because when you look, when someone says one thing, they're accusing someone else of the opposite. Um, we don't make sense. And I'm, I took this directly from what I read. Uh, we're not good stewards of the taxpayer money. We're not being reasonable. And that we're going to make the county commissioners raise taxes. That's my gist of what I got when I read that. Um, they also say we didn't take into account things like redistricting, CATS expansion, reducing the scope of the high school, making it smaller. Why we'd want to make a school smaller unless we absolutely had to. I don't make sense when you see all the building that's going around now. Um, even said we, sh you know, it, it was discussed, you know, building on the Statesville High School campus, another high school, which I think is completely in, um, a non-starter. And, you know, we can go through all this stuff, redistricting. Do we really want people in Troutman going to North Iredale? Because that's, or West Iredale. You drive by South Iredale on the way to West. Um, Cats expansion, by the time we expand Cats, to do, make any appreciable difference, we could have had the, the high school built. Um, I don't even address reducing scope. Um, you know, we were accused of delaying construction, you know, of, of costly add-ons. You know, and we, but we said we're flexible. These costly add-ons, you know, we, hey, come, let us know. And that was kind of the thought. Um, you know, and the bottom line said we can do these, you know, we can make some changes. It's not a hard uh, proposal that we gave. And what I understood, because I asked, that the process was that we should submit our estimate for the full school to the county commissioner. That's the legal process. They let us know what they, you know, if we can or cannot, and, uh, you know, said, you know, let us know what you can do and we'll go from there. That's what I got from, I was sitting there, that's what I got from it. Um, so in the negotiation via media, the response focused on the absolute maximum estimate that, of the ask, the absolute maximum, I, and which is an unpalatable $200 million, and I completely understand that. But that was the absolute ma maximum least probable um, outcome. But we focused on that for the whole argument, of the, for the, most of the argument in the article. Um, to me, this is just plain politics. It's playing politics, it's scapegoating the school board for when they spend the money. And, you know, I, when I ran, I, one of the things I wanted to do was hopefully have a better communication with county commissioners and school board. People have talked about it. I think the previous board worked to address it. I think 
My personal opinion is the current board has tried to address it. We try to have a professional relationship, and I think that's a good thing. We need to have professional relationships. Um, honestly, I just I thought about doing a narrative, but let's just cut through the, the stuff, and I use stuff in quotation marks here. Um, this is what I think, and I only speak for myself. Real simple. Tell us a number. Give us a number. Give us a maximum number that you can provide. I don't care how much, you know, how you get it. You know, we gave other funding offers. You don't have to provide all the money yourself up front. You know, you can do long term, short term, medium term, however you want to pay it off. That's not my purview. That's yours. But we gave options. Tell us the maximum number you can provide us and then let us, I mean the school system, not me, but in my opinion, the school board then can submit the best plan we can do for this number. How can I know what to submit if you don't tell me how much money we got? Doesn't make common sense to me. And maybe I'm just too dumb to know any better. But it's just, this number's like it's in hiding. I mean, what's the number? We guess and it's, you know, we're gonna stick a number on our head and start asking each other what it is. You know, just give us a number. You know, no more politics, no more scapegoating, no more political cover. I don't think the school system should give the county commissioners political cover for spending money because that's what I see this is what they're using us for. But that's just my opinion. I've been wrong many times. And don't use the media to make your points. Just talk to us. Um, you know, tell us what you can do. What can you do best for the kids of Iredale County? We'll do what we can best for the kids and the parents and the students and the, the economic development of Iredale County by providing the best school we can. And let's get this done. Let's not make this a fiasco. Let's get the school built. And I'm done. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Really? No one? Ms. Mita. Go ahead. Well, they, I've heard a few times they have said $120 million, and I think it's, it's, that's just, that's just what I've heard. So. Uh, and anyone else? Okay. okay. Go ahead, sir. Well, I agree with what Dr. Knight is saying. When and how much? When are you going to give us a number? Just give us a number. And if you want to take two of us and two of you, go in a room, lock the door, let's hash it out, come out with the solution. Let's do it. Second thing I wanted to bring up is um, I really applaud Dr. James and his team. The public may not really know that in the background they have worked extremely diligently hard on this high school um, project. In fact, working on Sunday nights to answer board questions from the board, late emails, late phone calls. So we're trying to come up with options. And so, you know, a lot of people worked really, really hard for a long period of time to design and come up with a new high school and the pandemic and the change in economic environment has really put us in a place that no one ever thought we would be and changed everything, but that's where we are. So commissioners, give us a number and give it to us now, and then we'll decide what to do, whether it's scale back the project, do whatever. But I want to again let everyone know that the staff has really done um, a lot of off hours work on helping to support at least this board's the questions. I'm also excited, and I'm sure Dr. James will talk about some activities coming up about in, um, in working to improve our poor performing schools. And uh, Superintendent, State Superintendent uh, Catherine Truitt was at, um, was visited us last week. And I was at Statesville High School and we were in a classroom with uh, predominantly um, black student population and the subject was why do a number of students in that classroom want to become teachers 
And I think it was, uh, her name is Ms. Campbell, maybe? Was it Campbell? I think was the teacher's name. And she's got a terrific program and encouraging students to become teachers. And Ms. Truett asked a gentleman, he says, why do you want to become a, a teacher? And he said, well, throughout, and this is, he's either a junior or maybe a senior. He says, throughout my school history, I had never had a black male role model as a teacher. So I'd like to give back and be a black male role model teacher for those future students coming down the pike. So I thought that was, that was tremendous. Tremendous comment because Dr. James is gonna talk about um, bringing in Baruti Caffelli um, to the school system to help us out and he'll be speaking on Wednesday night. I'm sure you'll talk about it. So I'm really excited about um, the direction uh, Dr. James and his staff are taking with bringing in some experts to help us uh, fine tune some things. Um, we had this community violence workshop last week. Um, this Scott, Marlene Scott, uh, putting together some community engagement with city of Statesville, community-based, faith-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, the police department, and so on. As we've said, Dr. James has said many times, it takes a village to raise a child. And school system can't solve every societal problem. And in fact, there's not a lot of home structure in some cases, and the schools are relied on to be that home structure, which we just can't always do. So with these multiple pronged attack, I'm really excited about the coming months to, to help turn around not only the city of Statesville, the crime on the streets, but our, our school. So I'm really excited about that. So uh, that's what I just wanted to mention. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to thank Dr. Knight for his comments with the school. Um, Kubenik, thank you so much as well. Um, I'm in agreement with those things. Um, was also at the uh, gang violence and present, uh, prevention along with Sloan and Kubenik, and it was a good program. Looking forward to seeing that play out, and hopefully we get some uh, solutions to some of those challenges up in Statesville. Um, also saw Catherine Truett here, uh, saw some wonderful cakes that the cats made. They were amazing. Um, I wanted to try every one of them, but they were like so multiple cakes but uh, <laughs> but uh, it was great to see her and, and I support her efforts of what she's doing statewide and I just uh, appreciate y'all serving on the board any other questions or comments well uh, one of the board members I don't usually read too much media because they lean so far left now so one of our board members sent me the information that uh, came out, I guess Sunday, um, from one of our media outlets. And, and I was upset because I always thought that the media, when a person writes an article, they give both sides of the story. But that wasn't the case. And I'm sorry to some of these people, but the last time they were in a school was when they graduated, sometimes 30 or 40 years ago. Schools have changed. I'm here to tell you it has really changed since I retired in 2004 from education. It is huge change. Uh, schools have become everything by mandate, not because we want to, it's because our legislature and our Department of Public Instruction and the United States says, you will. We really don't have a choice. But to toot our own horn, our Dell States for Schools is so far ahead of most school systems, not only in North Carolina, but nationwide. I noticed that uh, the, uh, the legislature in... Um, Texas was talking about putting an SRO in every school. Well, my goodness, 
We've already got that and have had. And, and I think those are things that people need to look at. Uh, we also have done more for safety of our children. Very few school systems has the rhino locks like we do. When we lock a door, you're not getting in. I mean, I mean, they took the police took uh, one of those rhino doors and had all their equipment, and it took them like ten minutes to finally, and they finally had to break the door in half. And that's how good those things are. And now, uh, I believe it's a requirement by the state for all new. Uh, buildings of schools. Well, I was upset because some people were talking about going backwards, uh, some of our community leaders. And when I say go backwards, they wanted us to stop early college. And for a small school system, uh, we got three early colleges, and that is a very positive thing. We save parents a bunch of money, and we give students a chance to get a college education where in most cases they'd be the first in their family to go to college. They also wanted us to get rid of our IB schools, which are very popular. Uh, parents like them. So if that was the case and they wanted us to send students where they were assigned, well, I think uh, the number at... Um, Lake Norman would be about 2,600. Now, if that happened, we could, there's no way we could do that. If we, I mean, we, we can't even bring a trailer at Lake Norman because of water shield. So we could not handle that many students. Now, I don't have the money and I don't know how much money they have because they don't tell you. And if you ask, they don't give you a straight answer. I'm sorry, you don't. Years ago, it was announced to this board, different board, but still was announced, uh, that the county commissioners was going to put a new high school on a bond for us. Now, we knew we were going to need a new high school, but we were in the process of gathering information to bring to the commissioners for a bond. Now, Mooresville already knew, so they already had architectural plans and site preparation where they built a middle school. So we got criticized because we were lagging. There was a secret meeting. There was only one board member there, and the commissioners told that board member, you're going to get $70 million. He said, that's not enough. He said, Mooresville, you're getting $30 million. They said, that's not enough. So they changed their mind and gave Mooresville $35 million for their new middle school and gave Iredell Stacial Schools $80 million. Well, it was announced to the board the next meeting, and, and there was six board members that looked at each other and said, what, what? I thought we were going to get the information together and bring it to the commissioners. Well, no. They had a secret meeting. And, you know, when you get elected, you have to go to, and this is required by the state, you have to go to an ethics training. And a public meeting is supposed to be held in front of the public. And I can assure you that did not happen in that case. Now, they can deny it all they want to. I don't care. I'm not running for office. But I can tell you that happened. Now, after that happened... I happened to be going to the North Carolina School Board's annual meeting in Greensboro, and there was about seven or eight architectural firms there. And I posed them the question, how much would a turnkey high school cost at that time? That was before the bond vote for 1,600 students. How could, how could you build it? And the lowest estimate was $97 million. 
That was then. Now I came back to and told one of the commissioners that. He said, uh, well, uh, just help me get this bond passed. Then the truth comes out. If Iredell Statesville Schools doesn't have something on the bond and only Morrisville graded, they knew it wouldn't pass. So we had to have something on there to get for a chance for that bond to get passed. Now, they may not like me saying that, and I don't care. It's the truth. And if the truth hurts you, I apologize. But that's the truth. Now, give us $125 million and allow us to go with Duke Energy or one of those companies and we'll build you the school. But you've got to tell us because I cannot believe the economics of having to build a school and the red tape because every public official wants to get involved. It is, it's not like building a house or even a factory. And maybe it shouldn't be because you got your, your children going in there and it better be right. And you're spending tax dollars and it better be right. But please, there's seven people here that hear about education every time we meet and even times we don't meet. You've got three or two former teachers and one that's present teacher right now on this board. We've been in and out of schools. I personally did ed specs on two different schools and built two stadiums. I know a little bit about it. But I wasn't on the committee. There was one board member on the committee and two county commissioners. And they met a hundred times. So uh, give us a break. The media did not report the truth. And all I ask for is the truth. Now you got you got reevalue on your property now. And they don't want to raise taxes because they ran on raise, not raising taxes. So they lowered the rate. And that's fine. I don't mind because I own a home too. But they're still going to make 50 million more. It's still going to make 50 million more. And put 26,000 houses more, they're going to make more money. They got 80 million in bonds they can sell. They had to put a penny of sales tax back. They got 14 to 17 million there. So they got 97 million, and it doesn't affect their budget. They got close to 200 million in reserve. They got the money if they want to spend it. And I'm saying, if you're going to invest in something, why not your children? That's a good investment. Because if you invest in your children, you don't have to build a bigger jail. Uh, and the statistics bear that out. So please, give us a number. And be responsible to the people of this county. Thank you very much. Dr. James. Thank you. Chairman Howe, I do want to thank Catherine Truitt, our state superintendent, for visiting Friday. She actually uh, went to several sites. Um, she did tweet out Friday night on and on social media, has quite a few pictures from our old Statesville schools, so I'd welcome you to go out and look at those. Uh, very complimentary of the many things that she saw. And uh, I would have to say to the chef, um, we could have easily had the uh, cake bake-off competition here and I think we might have come close to winning. They were that magnificent. It was uh, it was pretty neat. So tomorrow night uh, at uh, so Principal uh, Caffelli and Bill Daggett are going to be joining us. But one one thing I will say, and we've done a poor job of of educating the board. Uh, most of our staff has been through Ruby Payne training. We have Ruby Payne trainers on staff. So a lot of these individuals we have met with and worked with but um, you know sometimes it's a you know workshop uh, one-stop wonder does not work so it takes a partnership a relationship to come in and work together 
So Principal Caffelli actually uh, knows the team from Bill Daggett's organization that's going to be working with us this year. So I welcome them. So tomorrow night at Outback, the board, not everybody else, the board and uh, those individuals I invited, we're, I think about 530 he'll be there, but we'll start round six. Can't put us in a private room, of course, at Outback, but uh, it'll be time to break bread and have a conversation with Principal Caffelli. And um, he'll be at our schools tomorrow. He did, uh, the weather did delay him, so he, uh, he is going to try to get by MB Mills, but of course he'll be back. Bill Daggett will be here next week to speak to the board. Uh, he is a um, walking textbook of knowledge on what's going on in education, has turned around many school systems, his organization. So a great group to partner with. Um, it did, it did uh, uh, take me back a little bit last Wednesday night when once again, Someone stood up and blamed the school system for all the ills of society. At some point, parents need to take responsibility for the children they bore. So when we have kindergartners that come into our building and still in uh, diapers, and it doesn't mean they're special needs students, some of them, if you don't know their last name, you, you better hope you get it because when it comes to the end of the day, they'll be on the wrong bus. So that should not happen. We're in America. We're not in a third world country. And to me, that's child abuse. Any way you can stack it up. Uh, and there's help out there. There's a great video that shared that I shared with the board from the Partnership of Children. Uh, there's a lot of people that get down on their luck. And there's a lot of agencies out there to help you. We have over eight pages we presented of organizations that help us. So I wish I'd had that the other night, uh, Mr. Kubinick, to, to hand to this lady and say, here's what we're doing. What are you doing? So. Uh, I believe John, uh, John Kennedy said this, that's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I think we're at that point. We're doing all we can, folks. We are tapped out. We're spending every dime we got, plus anything else we can get our hands on. We're writing 15, 20, $30 million worth of grants a year to plug in the holes that uh, is not supplied by other funding. So at some point, we, we gotta have some parents step up. And a kid should not enter school when we test them on a two and three percent level, which is two to three grade levels behind. Think about that. A kindergartner walks in and we're testing them and 40% plus are testing at a three, two to three year old level. Now, we need to change the paradigm for school, I guess, and start at age one. But somebody is should be held responsible for educating that child before they get to us, but unfortunately they're not. So we try to fill the gaps. Then we take all the blame for when the school doesn't have an A or a B or a C, it's all our fault. Doesn't It doesn't work that way, folks. So glad to have those guys coming along with us. Uh, I'm, I was uh, involved with the, the new school process for quite a while. Uh, I heard it many, many times. Uh, when I lay down at night, I have a nightmare every night about it. I keep hearing, build a 50-year school and so that's what we that's what we gave you. If you had told us to build a five-year school, that's what we would have gave you. It might have been a lot cheaper. So the building itself, the square footage of the building is the cheapest thing on the venue. You can cut the building in half. You're not saving any money. It's the infrastructure. Uh, and we could have that argument. But so we were asked, you know, what skin are y'all going to put in the game? So when we presented, Tim presented all the things that we took off the plate, and it was $89 million. So there's the skin we're putting in the game. Uh, I'm one, I'm a taxpayer, and I've made this comment, and, and I would make it again. Uh, lived here all my life. Are we going to spend $200 million on a high school? I'll, I, if we do, you'll come, you can come out and put some flowers on my grave. So uh, again, $200 million just blew me away. I was projecting 135, uh, and I've asked for a number. Just, just give us a number so we can go to bid. And then when the bids start coming in, we can have another conversation. But I can't get it out to bid until you give me a number. Uh, I, I fully anticipate you're not giving me $200 million, uh, But just give me a number, whether it be 110 120 130 Just give a number. We'll put it out to bid. Then when the bids come back, we can have another conversation. There's no way we're going to build this school, or what can we not do right now and we can do in the future. So there's a lot of alternatives that we can work on, but we have to have that from the county commissioners. Just give us a number so we can go to bid, please. Um, our schools, I will say, matter of fact, I just got a text from Vicki Sawyer about another school system asking about safety. 
We have bulletproof shields and our K5s, Ricotta camera system we're putting up everywhere, but the camera system is an all-inclusive system. So when you do a guest check-in, Ricotta, you're checking into it. Um, it can follow you around the school. It's a little weird. But we also have environmental detectors in our bathrooms. They do VOC, they do humidity, and they do decimal level. Uh, SROs in every school. Not only do we have an SRO, we have uh, canine uh, canines in our schools. Getting, we're trying to find one for a middle school, unfortunately. And uh, the recent thing that we've looked at doing is e-hall pass, uh, another way to track data to sort of tell what goes on in our school and to provide a safer environment. Um, it's sort of hard to get in trouble uh, if if you're in class and not. You know, typically what happens is hallways, bathrooms, or lunchtime. So I do appreciate all the hard work of our staffs. Uh, we have taken a plethora of awards the last month, if you haven't been looking at them. We have got people going national. We've got a kid that went international, was on the radio with me um, in STEM. So uh, just uh, great things going on. And he was doing methane versus CO2. Uh, that could have been a more hilarious show, but we'll leave it at that. But uh, the kid is uh, going to an international STEM competition for Idle Statesville. So uh, thanks uh, for your support of Idle Statesville schools. And it does take a village, and we need your help. And most of all, I think we need your prayers if you're a praying individual every day. Uh, this is hard work, and we want to make the right decision. We would love to have the wisdom of Solomon. So thank you. And on Wednesday night, uh, Baruti Caffelli is going to be speaking at the Bentley Recreation Center at 6 p.m. So if you can come out to see him, uh, if you can get the word out to schools, it would be great for some high schoolers um, from some of our schools to come out and see him and even staff. He's a brilliant, brilliant man in my opinion, and I think uh, so excited to be able to meet him. Yeah, I forgot that part. Thank you, Mike. And so we'll, we've got that all out over social media, but he will be coming back. So if we don't, we'll have some more uh, more conversations with him in the community and the task force. I would encourage you to get involved in that. It was a great kickoff Wednesday night uh, and looking for more meetings. So thank you. Any other comments? Thank you so much, Dr. James and board members. We will survive. <laughs> Mr. Kelly. Mr. Chairman, I make the motion we adjourn. Do I have a second? second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. Any comments, questions? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you very much.